years why under Prime Minister Modi, uh, India is finally achieving its rightful place in the world. And on the other hand, we've had the likes of former Finance Minister P. Chidambaram explain why uh, India had been growing at any time. And he argued that India was actually growing faster during the UPA than it is now. And that India is growing not only because of the efforts, but despite that, that there's so much more that can be done on inflation, on unemployment. So is the government of the day doing a good job about building India's economic future or is the performance actually suboptimal? To talk about Mission 2047, the economic outlook in India's trajectory from here, join me in raising a round of applause as I welcome Jayan Sinha, Member of Parliament of the Bharatiya Janata Party and squaring off against him, one of India's top lawyers and senior uh, spokesperson and member of the Congress Party, Dr. Singhvi. So thank you very much for joining us. I want to start by asking Jayan Sinaji about the arguments made by Mr. Chidambaram at the India at 100 Summit. A, that India was growing at 9%, 8% during Manmohan Singh's time. Now, even your chief economic advisors think that India can grow only at 6% or so in the years to come. That We've been hearing a lot about foreign investment coming in, but the talk is more than the reality. And that India is growing for sure, but it's not growing because you're doing a fabulous job, but because we have a big population, we have a young population, and that is why we are growing. But we should be doing much more, and he thinks if the opposition had a chance, they'd do a better chance of steering the economy than you are. Let's start from there. Mr. Sinha. Good evening, Rahul, and uh, wonderful to be on the show, wonderful to be with my esteemed colleague, uh, Shri Abhushek uh, Manu Singhviji. And of course, uh, Mr. Chidamram is going to present the opposition's point of view. Sadly, he's completely wrong. The reality is that India has done a splendid job in the last nine and a half years, and we are probably the best position major economy on the planet right now. When the UPA left in 2013, 2014, India was counted as one of the fragile five economies uh, in the world. Now, everyone views us as the shining star of the global economy. And why is that? That is because when they left office in 2014, India was growing at 4%, had been growing at 4% for the last two or three years. Inflation was running at 10 or 12%. We had a large current account deficit. We'd just come out of a balance of payments crisis. So the economy was teetering on the edge. We were a fragile five country. Today, we are the shining star of the global economy, growing at about 7%. All the macroeconomic parameters are in robust health, and we are probably better positioned than any other economy right now. Why? Because our policies are excellent. We are growing very quickly. We are attracting foreign investment. We are attracting domestic investment at unprecedented rates. We have a healthy, young, well-trained workforce. And the positioning that the Honorable Prime Minister has done geopolitically for India has meant that we are attracting a tremendous amount of manufacturing investments. We are attracting investments uh, in the services sector and so on. So as you look forward, as the Honorable Prime Minister has said, India is going through an Amrit Kal. An Amrit Kal, the next 25 years, are going to see India as a Viksit Bharat, a developed country, a Viksit Bharat as a developed country. And here the fact that we are so well positioned after nine and a half years of our, of our leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister's visionary and uh, bold leadership means that we will be able to grow seven, eight, nine percent a year going forward. And if we can sustain those growth rates, and all indicators are that we can, we will be in 2047 a 25 trillion dollar economy with 15,000 dollars GDP per capita. That's where we are headed on path to be a global superpower driving sustainable prosperity for India and the world. That's how India is positioned today. Dr. Singh, we, the BJP contests furiously the suggestion that there is an inevitability about India's growth trajectory. Uh, the comparison that countries like Argentina have, from, uh, have fallen from positions of relative strength in economic prowess to a far weaker economic position because of economic and political mismanagement. 
And therefore, if India has emerged stronger from the pandemic, if the world now talks about China plus one and thinks of India as arguably the key beneficiary, if all the investment banks, big investors are excited about India becoming a $10 trillion economy in the next 10 years, the government argues it's because of the political stability and the vision of Prime Minister Modi and his government, which a fractured, unstable coalition simply cannot hope to provide. Dr. Singhvi. Uh, Rahul, just give me a few moments. I mean, first and foremost, let's be clear. Who would be the happiest if India became a developed economy in 2047? I would be the happiest, you would be the happiest, my friend Mr. Jansen, I would be the happiest. Each one of us would be proud. But look, we have to smell the coffee. We have to have a reality check because without a reality check, our approximation to the ideal which we all want may not be so easy and adjectives cannot take the place of facts. I'm sorry I'm going to give you a few facts, but these facts are important on two parameters. I will not do the comparator with Mr. Jansen I did. I'll do that second. The first is, there is a definition of a developed economy. It's not his perception of a, de a developed economy nor mine. The World Bank has defined a developed economy. That is something which is supposed to be a lower income, a lower middle income, an upper middle income, and a upper income country. Where are we at the moment? We are a, we are a lower middle income company, country with a figure of per capita between 1,000 odd dollars to 4,000 odd dollars. What is the World Bank definition of a developed country, which we must become in 2047? I would be the proudest person. It's 12,000 plus. Well, if you think we can go there, nothing like it. But that's the reality check. Number two, where are we on the, uh, uh, on the Human Development Index? There are only four things I'm going to say. The Human Development Index, unfortunately, ranks us 132 out of 191. And it deals with health, education, uh, happiness quotient, long and healthy life, etc., etc. The third index, the World Hunger Index, where does it put us? The Global Hunger Index puts us at 107 out of 121. Behind friends, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, even Rwanda. It's not something to be proud of, but it is important to have a reality check. We have to overcome all these obstacles to come anywhere near. And as far as the comparator goes, I'm not about Mr. Chidambaram or about Mr. Jayant Sinha. The comparators are published official government figures. The one year of 1314 is not relevant. The one year of 1920 is not relevant. The average annual per year growth rate, and now we have two comparators, 10 years of UPA and almost 10 years of NDA. <clears throat> the average annual growth rate with dips and with peaks for the UPA is 6.8%. It was actually 7%, but because of some happenstance, it became 68 The same figure for the UP uh, NDA is 5.4%. Judge for yourself. The Growth in percentage terms in the GDP, same periods, 97% the GDP grew in our time. It has grown 63% in the NDA time. Okay. The, just one half a minute more. Per capita has grown 5% in UPA, 4.2, and most important, unemployment. 8.3% CMI published figures. It's been between two and a half to four odd percent right through UPA. So let's not, you know, it's very good to be proud, it's very good to him, and I, as we said, it's something for which every Indian should be proud. But then we have to not do back thumping, back slapping, self-congratulatory boasts, and also, of course, the most important about this government, an exclusivist approach. India started in 2014, economic growth started in 2014. India's Exponential growth started in 2014. Let's not be exclusivist. Dr. Singhvi bringing the power of rhetoric as a lawyer to an economic argument, but to make the point which Mr. Chidambaram made before him that if you look at the growth rate of the GDP on the watch of Manmohan Singh, compare that with the current government, data says India grew faster under the UPA. Point number two, it's not just about how fast the GDP is growing, there's also on your watch increasing income inequality. India's
per capita GDP is at 128 in an international ranking and therefore there is higher concentration of wealth amongst the rich the poor are getting poorer and that's happened on your watch. Slower growth, greater income inequality. Jayan Sinha. Rahul, with all due respect to two very eminent and senior parliamentarians, Shri Chidambaram ji and Abhishek Manu Singhvi ji, I have to reject what they're saying. Now, let me first come to the issue of growth, GDP growth, GDP per capita growth, then I'll come to the issue of inequality. First, when we talk about GDP growth rate, there are two reasons why just a simple recitation of the GDP growth rate over nine and a half years is utterly wrong. First, when we handed over the economy to the UPA in 2004, the economy was growing at about seven or eight percent. They inherited an economy that had tremendous momentum, tremendous momentum. And they sustained the momentum for a period of time till their bad economic policies, I will say, caught up with them. They tank the economy, led it to 4% growth for two years, the high inflation and all the other factors that I mentioned earlier. So factor number one, they got a very good economy, they tanked it, they drove it into the ditch. Number two, we had a once in a hundred year crisis that we had to deal with. It's called COVID. Around the world, GDP growth rates dropped dramatically for every country, including in India. We had the lowest, we had negative GDP growth rate of minus 7% or so uh, in uh, COVID, the COVID year of 2021-2022. And this was the worst economic performance of India's economy post-independence. Never happened before. So if our growth rate has come down, it's come down because of the COVID pandemic. And of course, as I said, they inherited an economy in great shape. We inherited an economy that was in the ditch, growing at 4%, and we had to put it back on the rail. So we turned that economy around. We dealt with the COVID pandemic. And now you have an economy that is called the shining star of the global economy. So as I said, with all due respect to my senior colleagues, I reject the arguments. That is utterly incorrect. Now, let's come to your second question of inequality. As far as inequality is concerned, the human development indicators that Abhishek ji mentioned have indicated that we have taken a massive number of people out of extreme poverty, about 150 million people, 15 crores. That extreme poverty in India is coming down very, very sharply, very, very quickly because of the very inclusive policies that we followed. The whole world in the B20, the G20, in every global conference is praising India's social safety net that we've created. The 80 crore people that are getting free food through the Garib Kalyan Yojana, the Ayushman Bharat that we've created which is providing people free health care, the DBT that we have created so that Kisan Saman Nidhi and other such social safety net programs are directly coming into people's bank accounts. So we are massively making our growth inclusive. We are reducing and in fact have almost eliminated extreme poverty. And that is why we are so well positioned for the future. Now, coming finally to the point that Abhishek ji said about being a developed country, he's absolutely right. It's not my definition or his definition. It's the World Bank's definition. And as he correctly pointed out, the World Bank's definition of an upper income country is over $14,000. I quoted that if we sustain growth rates of 8%, which is what we are aiming to do, by 2047, we will be a $25 trillion economy with $15,000 GDP per capita defined as an upper income country, defined as a developed country. Dr. Singh, we you cannot take away, when you look at the total GDP growth rate in the last nine years, the fact that you had a one hundred year COVID pandemic, which obviously crashes and negatively impacts growth. And the second assertion that you inherited from Vajpayee ji a much stronger economy, which they say uh, became strong because of the policies followed by the Vajpayee government, whereas because of the policies followed by your government, they claim they inherited a weaker economy and you had the Russia-Ukraine war and you had the pandemic. Rahul, nobody is denying COVID. COVID is a given and it is also COVID which gives you artificially rocketing and exponentially rising growth rates post-COVID. On a negative or low base, you know what happens to the successive years. But we are giving you here average annual growth rates for 10 years. That is, divide the whole growth rate and divide by 10 years versus 9. There cannot be any jugglery about this. 
How can there be now? If you start saying and blaming everything on legacy, then you are a poor loser. You are finding excuses. You have a legacy of Nehru, it's bad. You have a legacy which we inherited. You inherited such a bad economy that you took 10 years to get out of it. Will anybody believe that? The average annual growth rate, some years of course the actual annual growth rate was 8%, 8.5. But the average is 6.4. You are down at 5.2 and you are attributing it to legacy. You have to find a better excuse. Jensen, I'll, I'll respond to this. No, one second, I'll tell you the reason. The reason he might not want to mention, obviously he cannot. Reason number one is that well before COVID, the economy got a kick in the solar plexus. In October, November 2016, it's a kick which is a short-term COVID kick. It's a, fortunately, it did last as long as COVID. It lasted several months. It's called demonetization. It got another problem of a flawed, of a flawed GST. Of course, after opposing GST, GST is now their showpiece. But GST was never imagined for seven rates, including the recent one of 28%. Most amazingly, it is because of this uh, going back to pre-91, uh, I mean, virtually turning the clock back on liberalization. Have you seen the uh, trade policies? The trade policies have had the highest number of increase in tariffs, 3,000 tariff increases by them, affecting 70% of India's imports, introduction of license Raj in things like importing laptops. How many free trade agreements have you signed? As far as I know, not a single one. You are negotiating several, but not signed any. We signed 11. These are excuses when you talk of legacy. The reasons are demonetization, trade policy is not good enough, flawed GST, manufacturing base not sufficiently increased, etc., etc. So, you know, you have to be frank, you have to be upfront, and we can all join together to help. But don't always say that it is because of what you inherited. You've gone back to inheritances from Nehru. Jay and Sina, Dr. Singhvi and Mr. Chidamram both making the argument that you're actually becoming more protectionist. Uh, going back to the pre-1991 era where India was isolationist, uh, he, uh, he mentioned the tariffs on laptops and also the fact not that… Not one even FTA, not one FTA. And also the argument that your government's top economic advisors seem to be referring to like a 6% or so uh, rate of economic growth in the years to come, whereas their aspiration, their delivery was much higher. Whereas your aspiration only now, as pronounced by your top economic advisors, is of a 6% rate of growth, that you're simply not aiming high enough, despite initially claiming that you wanted double-digit uh, rates of growth. Let me first address uh, the two issues that Abhishek Ji brought up. Number one, he talked about demonetization. And number two, he talked about legacy. Legacy comes first, let me explain the legacy issue. The Indian economy is like an aircraft carrier. You can't turn it around in one minute. It's not a speedboat. It's an aircraft carrier. Once you point it in a certain direction, it takes a while to turn it around. So it's not a question of legacy. When you inherit an economy growing at 4%, turning it around, addressing the NPA issue of the banks, addressing our current account deficit, you know, fixing our export engine, these things take time. And they did take time. I was part of the team that worked on addressing all of these issues and we turned it around and we had very rapid growth once we had turned it around. So it's not a question of legacy, it's a question of what the reality is when you're dealing with a large-sized economy like India's at three, four trillion dollars, number one. Number two, let's come to the issue of demonetization. There is a belief among many serious economists that demonetization has in fact contributed to faster economic growth in India because it has really, really helped us in formalizing the economy. And let me bring GST into it as well, which is what Abhishek Ji addressed. And between demonetization and GST, we have formalized the economy. We are enjoying the benefits of UPI. We are enjoying the benefits of digitization. In large measure, it's because of demonetization and GST, and that's driving growth. That's why we are very well positioned right now, and the world is praising our digital public infrastructure. So I've addressed both the legacy issues and the demonetization issues. Let me now come to trade. When it comes to trade, you have to understand that we are dealing with a neighbor that's not playing fair. We have a neighbor that's not playing fair, that's following trade mercantilist policies that require import restrictions by virtually every country, even the US. 
which is, you know, very proudly uh, free trading, free market country, has imposed import restrictions and import tariffs on Chinese goods. Why is that? Because you have a country that's not playing by the rules. So we've got to fix the rules so that our companies are also on a level playing field relative to Chinese companies. And then through the very, very progressive and the very successful PLI scheme, we are driving growth in manufacturing and there are many successful examples. I'll just point to smartphones to tell you that we are now exporting smartphones No, in but India. there the argument by the likes of Raghuram Rajan earlier and Mr. Chitamram today is that you're basically assembling smartphones, he said. This is not manufacturing in the true sense of manufacturing. This is just marginal value add, largely assembly and therefore it's no big deal. So value add is going up continuously, Rahul, and it takes time for you to bring the entire value chain, including some of these very specific, high value, very high technology components, which include semiconductors, which include displays. The displays on these phones are very, very high tech uh, manufactured products. So it takes us time to set up the factories to do displays. It takes us time to set up the factories to do semiconductors, to do storage. And by the way, we have PLIs against all of these so that we will build the entire value chain in India. And we know that's what countries uh, uh, would like India to do. We're getting a lot of support from the US and Europe in that regard. And companies like Apple and Tesla are coming to India and producing those very, very sophisticated goods that are required and which will over time lead us to be even more competitive. You want to make a quick argument because I just want to shift gears and talk no, about… Just two comments. Uh, China, nobody is talking about. China doesn't come in the way of your FTAs with several other countries. We did 11. You've done none. No, they're saying we're Second, negotiating hard. We don't want to that's compromise all right. on no, no. India's interests. You can negotiate. We're talking of 10 years on 10 years. Of course, a lot of things which my good friend is saying is about the future. And the future, I hope, turns out very well for him. He'll have all these things in the future. We're talking of the past. We're talking of the comparison. The future has to be judged partly on the basis of the past. And this is a very good time to do it because it's almost 10 years versus 10 years. On manufacturing, I want to give you a reality check. You know how much is India's share of manufacturing? Yes, the PLI will do well in the future, I hope so. But it started only two years ago, in a big way, one and a half years ago. You've had nine years. The world, sh the India's share of world manufacturing is 3%. China's is 28%. Actually, our own, we have become a very good service sector country, something to be proud of. But we've not no, done but very they can argue they're laying much more emphasis on manufacturing in India and ensuring uh, that companies like Foxconn, Apple, several others come to India. There's this whole ecosystem that's no, being that's built. Therefore, to therefore, criticize therefore, PLI and value add is very easy. They're trying to build no, an I'm ecosystem. I'm not criticizing which takes PLI time. at all. I'm a big supporter of PLI. I'm saying these are all in the womb of the future. And we are not astrologers of this program. We are talking hard facts. And I'm just giving you all a reality check to know where we stand. Let's not, you know, projections cannot take the place of reality. Uh, very, uh, you know, chest-thumping claims should never take the chest of reality, except especially in economic matters. That's all I'm saying. Well, Rahul, I'm not talking about so much the past or even the future. I'm talking about today. And I'm telling you, we are well positioned to being a global superpower driving sustainable prosperity. And with all due respect to Abhishek Ji, I think he's arguing against his own position. Because he's saying on the one hand that China is 28% of global manufacturing. Then he's saying this is not about China, it's about other countries. It is about China. Because if you look at many of the industries of the future, whether you look at uh, smartphone manufacturing, you look at electronic components, you even look at some types of software like TikTok, or you talk about solar panels, or you talk about batteries. In all of these cases, the competition, the unfair competition we're dealing with is from China. So we've got to level pl the playing field, and we have to give our companies the kind of support that the US is giving through the, its Inflation Reduction Act, that Europe is giving through its Green New Deal. And so we have to be able to provide a level playing field. Now, I'll conclude, Rahul, by saying the following. I am a free marketeer, I am a competition person as much as anyone else. But at the same time, and this is why we are so forceful in the G G20, we've got to ensure a level playing field for all countries and all companies around the world. We don't have that right now. So we have to support our companies while at the same time pushing for free and open markets. I want to spend a moment on the big G20 leader summit which happens 
uh, in the beginning of September and the amount of energy that the government and the Prime Minister himself have invested in making India's presidency a grand success. I had the opportunity of interviewing the Prime Minister earlier this week and he spoke of how in India's G20 presidency, he thinks, Dr. Singh, we will be a catalyst to a new world order. We had uh, Borge Brande, the president of the World Economic Forum, with us at this Business Today India 800 Summit. He spoke of the future being defined in the international world order by the G3. The US, China and India. This is not Jayan Sina or Piyush Goyal or Nirmala Sitaraman saying that this is the president of the World Economic Forum acknowledging an emerging India. Under your watch, India was at best a middle power. Because of what Jayan Sina and his party have done over the last nine years, they claim they have set India on a trajectory of being a great power in the years to come, being the G3. Just examine your words, Rahul. Aren't they overinflated? India is on the rise. India is on the rise for a variety of factors. Each year brings a gradual growth in those factors. A huge anti-China sentiment across the world, cutting across countries and ideologies, is helping that. But to even suggest, imagine how egotistic and exclusive it is to suggest that India has become great only and solely because of the efforts of NDA, and that too in the last few years. We are very proud to have the G20 here. G20s have been held, held earlier. We immediately concede that we've never been able to manage events with projections even half as well as the NDA does or Prime Minister Modi does. Certainly Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh could not do that management of events as well. But then, let not, let's not allow bubbles to take the place of reality. The G20 is a venerated institution. India's presidency has come at a time when everything is going hunky-dory. We are integrated with the West and there's a huge anti-China sentiment and we must capitalize on and that. Basically, you are just lucky. That. But to suggest lucky because that what, when, the, when the actual figures which I'm saying speak for themselves, then how can you use the… You see, there's a difference between figures and the adjectives. It's as simple as that. There's a disconnect between my figures and the adjectives you use. Let's build on the argument that Dr. Singhvi is making. That A, on account of the economic policies followed by China during the pandemic, they've emerged weaker. On account of the real estate debt bubble that kept building, companies like Evergrande, Country Garden are going under and there is suddenly a wobble in the Chinese economy and because of the fact that the Chinese supply chains proved unreliant uh, during the pandemic and soon after, the world is now looking at diversifying manufacturing outside China, not because India's red tape has come down per se, or it's become easier to do business in India, but because this is a global tailwind which is helping you. It's looking better than it is because you're just lucky. Rahul, this reminds me of the famous saying uh, that Napoleon Bonaparte was quoted on. Somebody asked him, what kind of generals do you want, Napoleon? And he said, I want them lucky. Lucky is something that comes from preparation, it comes from being opportunistic, it comes from doing the right things at the right time. So that's how we have got here. Of course, it is about the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister and all his senior colleagues. But fundamentally, and here I fully agree with Abhishek Ji, it's about all of us as Indians. And just think about the show that we had before this one, Rahul. We were celebrating the incredible success of Chandrayaan. What a proud moment for all of us as Indians. And what did the Honorable Prime Minister do after the BRICS summit? He flew directly to Bangalore where he celebrated ISRO. He celebrated the scientists and engineers of India. He celebrated India's incredible efforts to really build up our space capabilities and our space economy. If we are doing well today, of course it is because of India and of course it is because of Indians, but what we have done is we have unleashed the capabilities, the energy, the entrepreneurship of all the great Indian talent that exists. That is what the UPA could not do is to unleash that entrepreneurial energy. We have unleashed it through our policies. We can see it in Chandrayaan. We could see it in our unicorns. And we are seeing it now as Dr. Singh, we investors are, and visitors are flocking to India. Many people who are sitting here watching you across the multiverse will say that you are being unfair in calling the Prime Minister an event manager. Now imagine… I didn't 
You said event अच्छा करते। नहीं। You said he is good at events better than Manmohan Singh। I said we can see that we cannot do events projections as well as he does. We said that's very different thing in event management. No, but but sir, imagine. I am very careful about the kind of terms I use for the prime minister. That's why you are one of the best and highest paid lawyers in the country, which is fine. No, no, he's our prime minister. He's not Mr. Jain Sinha's prime minister or your prime minister. He's the country's prime minister. Of course, he's the prime minister of all India. He deserves. Just as I would expect the prime minister to have said. No, you didn't hear my question. Just, just one second. I'm interrupting for. Just as I would have expected the Prime Minister to say, which he doesn't say, uh, congratulations Vikram Sarabhai, congratulations Nehru, congratulations Indira Gandhi, and that said congratulations Isro. I wish he had said that. You know, you, you compared Manmohan Singh with uh, Prime Minister Modi. The fact is, after having attended the BRIC summit in South Africa, to get off the flight early in the morning and to go meet those scientists, that, you know, we had Dr. Somnath, uh, and five uh, ISRO scientists here at the India 800 summit, they were genuinely emotional. I mean, that is leadership. That is leading from the front. That's not event management or saying that it's not just events. No, no, no. You know, that no, is no, no, standing. No, no, no. When, when they failed, he stood with them, lent them a shoulder when they were crying. No, but when uh, they're celebrating, he's joining them in their success. Rahul, that has not been criticized remotely by anyone. What is criticized is an exclusivist approach as if the space program was born yesterday, as if it is the NDA's achievement. It's India's achievement built on foundations at least 50 to 60 years old. That's all I'm saying. Of course, the Prime Minister has done a great thing and he has remarkable energy to have come down and gone there. He should do it. He's the leader of the country and everybody needs their ego and their energy to be boosted, as Isro does. But the point I'm making is this government and this Prime Minister is far too exclusivist. Respond he to is not collective, he doesn't want to carry people with together. It can't be I, me, myself in a democracy. This especially, especially in space, in atomic energy, in foreign policy. These are fundamental foundations built by stalwarts right from the days of Nehru, right through succeeding generations. This suggestion or the insinuation that things are happening now and they never happened in the past, the Congress contests that furiously essentially making the point that growth and India's journey is a continuum. You can't make it seem as if nothing happened before 2014, that India was in the pits. Everything that's happening now, including the Chandrayaan, rides on the back of India's journey from the 40s in, in the space arena, from the 60s to now. You give no credit and therefore he's accusing you of being exclusivist. That's entirely wrong, Rahul. In fact, I can turn the tables on them. Yes, Pandit Nehru was our Prime Minister for 17 years, but after his death, we named it the Nehru Memorial Library and it was only a museum for one Prime Minister. What about all the other Prime Ministers who came after that? What about their contributions to the country? Atal Bihari Vajpayee was Prime Minister for six years, but we still called it the Nehru Memorial. It is our Prime Minister with his inclusive thinking, not his exclusive thinking, that has made it a memorial to all Prime Ministers Every Prime Minister is highlighted there, their contributions are highlighted there. Sadly, I will have to say that as far as the Congress Party is concerned, in the thrall of one single family, everything was named after one family. It was only one family that counted. All the contributions that were made, that were made by all the other stalwarts of the freedom struggle through all the development that India went through, none of that was highlighted. I could actually say they are being exclusive and we are being inclusive. So, Let's not get into that level of rhetoric, but the fact of the matter is, I would say very clearly, action after action demonstrates that our government has been very, very inclusive. We have highlighted everybody's achievements and everybody's accomplishments. Let's build on this exclusivist versus inclusivist uh, argument, because Jensen has a very good point. Under your government, everything was named some Gandhi something, right? The Nehru Memorial Library is the example he cited. Most people sitting here would argue that calling it the Prime Minister's Museum and Library is so much better than calling it the Nehru Memorial because that seems to suggest that nobody else did everything uh -huh. and that life began and ended with Nehru. This is trivializing the concept of inclusivity. If Jain Sinha's best example for inclusivity is the Nehru Memorial change to a Prime Minister's Museum, then I sub submit it would be almost laughable. Inclusivity is measured I don't think anybody, anybody, quantitatively or qualitatively, can call India a more inclusive country after 2014. 
how can you be inclusive when you have so much divisiveness every day in your newspapers? Inclusivity is pluralism. Inclusivity is diversity. Inclusivity is a sense of confidence in every person. Now, I don't… this is a business today conclave, but you cannot create a business environment with so much of fear among sections of the, uh, of the nation. Those are also Indians. And you are calling yourself more inclusive? Your inclusivity is a distorted definition of inclusivity. And it does not reach large sections of people. In fact, you have uh, promulgated a climate of fear amongst them. Every day, the head-hanging and shaming incidents we read of the newspapers, including today, about a school and a principal, has created a climate which is the antithesis of inclusivity. In Please don't trivialize when the issue. Don't trivialize the issue by giving an example of one building. When there is an election on the anvil, economic arguments in the end, you know, make their way towards politics. But no, Manipur, these aren't examples, Jain Sina, of inclusivity. These are examples of exclusivity, and no business confidence in a global context can be uh, generated in a society where there are social tensions and therefore if India is truly to grow, you need to be far more inclusive is the argument that Dr. Singhvi makes than you are. It's not just about the bells and whistles of policy, it's also about having genuine inclusivity in our approach. Rahul, our government's mool mantra is Sapka Saath, Sapka Vikas, that is inclusion. 80 crore people are getting free food grains, that is inclusivity. Everybody has got a toilet, that's inclusivity. Everybody has got electricity, that's inclusivity. Everybody got vaccinated, that's inclusivity. We have roads for everyone, we have infrastructure for everyone. So as far as government services, delivery of all of these welfare programs are concerned, there's nothing more inclusive than making sure that there is universal delivery of these essential public services, which we have achieved. That is inclusivity, number one. Number two, and of course Abhishek ji is really the expert here and I'm speaking very far out of my uh, domain of expertise, but as far as our constitution is concerned, we have Article 14, Right of Equality under Law, Article 19, all of these uh, rights are guaranteed to us, the right to freedom of religion, the right to expression, freedom of expression, the right to eat what you want, the right to live where you want, the right to commerce, all of these are granted under our constitution. We have sworn an oath to that constitution. To think that all of us as parliamentarians or public representatives that have sown a sacred oath to that constitution will engage in this kind of behavior, I don't think I will accept that or anybody in my party will accept that. So, ultimately, it's also about public validation, Dr. Singh. We were coming to the end of this uh, session. The government can claim, you know, it's about your idea of India, your pitch to the voters and the fact that they choose them. You can't say that you are better of, if the voters are continuously picking them. Uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, errors of history is to assume that electoral validation is the truth or is correct. It is precisely against majoritarianism that rights in the constitution are guaranteed. Almost 30% uh, of part 3 of the constitution is intended to act as a bulwark against the majority. The majority always wins because it gets the more votes. That's the precise reason why you have these rights entrenched in favor of those who are not majority. And so we can a, trust Abhishek ji to fight for these rights as a constitutional lawyer. Well, I do that so our faith day. is in his hands and very good answer. I, I do that every day in courts. But that cannot change the fact that we are talking theory about oaths and about articles. But we are not talking practice. I don't think anybody can deny that there is an ambience of divisiveness, distrust, trust deficit of an unprecedented level. And I'm now talking business. You cannot have stability, fast growth without a climate of trust and that is also because India is the planet Earth's most diverse spot. We do no service or no largesse to anybody by being inclusive. We do a favor to ourselves by being inclusive because it is self-preservatory. Jensen, our final words. 
Final words, these are business issues, business topics. I have complete faith and trust with my colleagues in the legal profession like Abhishek ji, who are fighting every day and I applaud them for that. Fighting every day for our constitution, for our constitutional rights, making sure that they are upheld. As long as we have these checks and balances, we don't need to worry. We will certainly make sure that we have a rock solid, well-functioning constitutional democracy. Well, we've had a high caliber verbal joust. So, can we have a round of applause as we thank our gladiators in this uh, session, uh, Jayan Sinha and Dr. Singh. We thank you very much for lighting up uh, this summit with the power of your arguments. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. For an enthralling session, I'd like to call Siddharth Zarabi, Managing Editor, Business Today TV, to felicitate our esteemed guests. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all our partners and sponsors, supported by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Logistics Partner, All Cargo, Celebration Partner, Radico, Radio Partner, Red FM 93.5, Ambient Media Partner, Khushi, Gifting Partner, India Circus by Krishna Mehta, and Trade Media Partner, Best Media Info. Now before we, before we wrap the day's proceedings, a huge round of applause for our final session. And the only man standing in between a lovely dinner with cocktails is, and you is not me, it happens to be Siddharth Zarabi, Managing Editor, Business Rate TV. I'm your host, Ayush Alavadi, saying thank you.